Howdy folks, welcome back to Boondockery. Today's video is a follow-up to the video I just posted on the Mystery Ranch Thor 3. If you saw that video, you know that this video, this uh, particular pack was designed specifically to transport an IED jammer. That's an improvised explosives device jammer that was heavily used in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I purchased it in hopes of using it as a load hauler. Well, if you watched the video, you saw that it does sort of kind of work okay as a load hauler. However, you also saw how easy it's going to be for me to modify this pack to do the job that I originally purchased it for. I'm going to show you all the areas that I need to modify, and then I'm going to show you how I'm going to go about modifying it and tomorrow I'm going to do a little wild camp and I'm going to test out this pack to see if my modifications worked in the way that I wanted them to and if not see what I need to do to change it. Just a real quick reminder if you like what's going on on the channel don't forget to click like and subscribe and click that notifications bell if you want to keep up to date on all the videos I have going on. Also if you see anything on my channel that you think someone else might be interested in, don't forget to share that. Also, make certain you check out my YouTube channel page. Check out the discussion section on that page and become part of the, uh, the conversation. I've posted uh, something recently on uh, making wild camp caches and that's still an active conversation. and. It's there specifically for us to be able to communicate in a much easier way than just the comments. Because when people make the comments on um, the videos, that scrolls all the way down. I, I could have people commenting on my very first video or my very recent video. And sometimes it's very difficult for me to be able to find the comments when they come up, especially if they're replies to comments that have already been made. When it goes to the discussion page, I can check that and scroll down and see everything I need to see when I need to see it to keep that conversation alive and active as soon as I see it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over all the deficiencies that I found in this pack that prevents it from being the load hauler that I'd really like it to be. And then I'm going to go through the modifications I'm going to go to uh, to you know, remedy those situations. First of all, I don't know if I showed everyone how it is when it's compressed, how it looks when it's compressed. And it pulls it close to the backboard. However, it's not rigid by any means. It will flop around quite a bit. So if you're just going to be utilizing this as a day pack, uh, it's going to shift it's going to move around a good little bit and I don't really care for that considering this is going to be a very small amount of weight that's in here it may not be a, a tremendous issue for most people but it's just one of those things that's sort of yeah see I'm going to see what I can do about uh, remedying that uh, it may not be anything I can do immediately but we're going to see also the compression straps here if you notice, they're in the front part of the pack, right up here to the front, and it goes back here. And it really pulls the front toward the back. And again, if you are doing your load first, load this thing up first and then pull that, that's fine. However, it doesn't really secure and snug this back section of the pack to the backboard. So that's one of the issues I'm going to be looking at. Another issue is this top protective board here. When it's open and fully deployed, it has a nice cover, it can click into these buckles. However, when it's stowed, it doesn't do that. And this part of the pack flops around pretty easily. So I'm going to be looking at the possibility of adding additional buckles on the inside to buckle those in place just to hold that where it needs to be held for the duration of my use. Open this up. Let's 
Let me get around to this side. I'm going to point out one of the issues that I have with it, especially for being used as a load hauler. This bottom strap, it's on the very bottom portion of the pack, which as far as compression goes, makes it just about pointless and worthless. However, it does hold the bottom of the pack into a position above this bottom section and keeps it from flopping around too much. So this is something I don't really want to remove because it does do something positive. However, as far as a compression strap goes, it does nothing. Now, on the inside, this pack is festooned with molly webbing. I have four sections of molly webbing and also I could utilize this compression strap that normally went around the IED jamming device. So I can definitely use all of those in connection with all of these that are on the back part of the pack to pull these two sides together and the more straps I have on there the more likelihood I have of retaining everything inside the pack as a load hauler. So I'm definitely going to be adding straps that are going to be connecting the molly webbing on the back panel to the molly webbing on the back side of the main compartment. These straps were the straps that were designed to hold the IED jamming device in place. And as I pointed out in my previous video, that these are woefully inadequate to utilize to hold in any decent sized hard box, ammo can, what have you. We're looking at a, a, a space that's approximately eight inches by three and a half inches. And that's with the straps fully extended. So this is going to be another area that I'm going to hopefully modify and improve to where I can get a container in here that is the entire size of the bottom area of the cargo area. And that is definitely probably we got about nine to 10 inches by up to a foot. So that almost doubles the amount of area that this strap can handle. And when I do that, Mystery Ranch has made it very easy for me. Every single one of the buckles I'm looking at modifying or the webbing I'm thinking about modifying that goes to these buckles, they've separated them and the male, excuse me, the male and the female buckle. So therefore the buckles that I've purchased are going to be one buckle to one modification as opposed to having to modify the pack using only half of the buckles that I own. That's a logistic type of thing. Uh, and those are things you have to consider. You have to think about those things prior to purchasing the, the items you want to use to make modifications on your pack. You really have to think about those things because even though when you buy these in bulk, they may not appear to be that expensive. If you're just going to go out and buy a couple buckles by buying them individually, they're a lot more expensive. And you don't want to have to find a location to where you're going to order or go to the uh, actual storefront and purchase these items, get them back to your house and realize that, oh, wow, uh, this isn't going to work for what I need or I need more. So you always want to make sure that you get a good detailed plan of what you want to do with your modifications make a good thorough list, double check them before you go to order them. Or if you're lucky enough to actually have a store that's close enough to you that actually sells these types of buckles or any of the other materials that you're going to be needing, you want to make sure that that list is complete and thorough and um, be able to make your purchases. All right, folks, I believe I have assembled everything I'm going to need to make these modifications. I'm going to start over here. I have a hacksaw that I can actually use to cut through these ladder locks and I'll explain how I'm going to use these things as I go. However, 
if you don't have a hacksaw, you have a little craft saw here or something like that, that'll work fine. And there's also the ability to be able to use uh, wire cutters to cut through the ladder locks as well. Both has its advantages and disadvantages, and I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Need a Sharpie to um, mark off uh, the distance that you're going to need to cut off webbing. You may or may not need that. It's entirely up to you. If you want to measure everything out at once, mark everything, cut everything at once, that works out real well. If you cut things one at a time, you might not need that. I have an X-Acto knife here that I'm going to be using to remove an object uh, from the shoulder straps. I have a lighter here to burn off the end of the webbing, just to fray it out just a little bit. Scissors to cut the webbing. I have one inch multicam webbing. I also have a roll of two-sided Velcro. This comes in handy for all kinds of things, including a webbing tamer. I can actually sew that into position on the end of any of my webbing and use that to wrap around the webbing and to keep that in place so you don't have all those loose webs going everywhere. And in order to sew these things into position, I have uh, some um, three ply waxed linen thread and a good sturdy large sewing needle. I have my slide buckles. I believe I have everything that I need as far as the number of those go. If by any chance I need more, I do have more. I have two different types of molly clips. One is webbing that has a rigid stay in it. The other is a malice clip. These things have been around for a very long time. These were the first ways that you could use molly pouches with the old Alice style um, belts and webbing. You can use these with rucksacks, things like that. Anything Alice, these make it easier for you to be able to convert uh, molly over to those. I've got these so I can experiment to see if these will actually work better than the ladder locks to attach my webbing. All of my webbing and straps are going to be put on in a way to where they are temporary. And the reason I want them temporary, because if I'm going to take all the time to sew by hand the webbing into the locations I want to keep them, that's a tremendous amount of time. And if I take it out, try it out in the field, and it doesn't work, I have to take the seam ripper or X-Acto knife, cut that back out, and redo it to where it will work. The nice thing about using the ladder locks or the malice clips, the molly clips, any of those things, it's temporary. However, it will work. It's going to be very rigid. It's going to work well. And I may not necessarily have to go into all of the sewing. And like, again, with all the modifications I'm making with the, um, this pack, to take the time and to sew everything in, in place, it's going to take a good bit of time. Once I try it out and I think it, it works well, if I think it's going to be advantageous for me to go ahead and remove any of these temporary things, which can work long term as well, I can go ahead and remove those and sew those. I can even take this to the field with me and make those modifications when I'm sitting around uh, camp and um, don't have anything else I need to do or want to do at the moment and just uh, sew one strap at a time until I have everything finished. If by any chance I need any other objects than what you see here, I will tell you about those as we go along. If you're going to be using either of the saws to cut through your ladder locks, I would recommend using some type of a small vise, something to be able to hold those steady because if you are trying to utilize your saw and working this back and forth, you, have, you run the risk of cutting your fingers. I would not recommend holding it like this and cutting in with the saw. You have greater control if you use uh, the saw in a uh, good st sturdy position, move that back and forth slowly, and it'll cut through them safely and effectively. The first order of business is 
I was going to remove this uh, bunch of Velcro. I, I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, and I honestly can't think of any reason why I would need this at all. And um, <laughs> it's uh, one of those things, I guess you call it, uh, Bob Ross would call it a happy accident because when I was contemplating going through the rigor morand of using my X-Acto knife to cut the, all those stitching out to remove that, I happened into a wonderful surprise. As I was looking closely as to how I could get in and cut that uh, stitching to remove this Velcro, I saw that it's only Velcroed into place. So if by any chance I could ever find a use for this, it is intact. If I ever find a good use for it to where I could use it on the straps again, I can always put it right back. So this was probably the fastest and easiest modification that I did to this pack. Moving on to the next modification. I did not let, like how the webbing that's provided here, the clips, worked in order to use it as a load frame. So what I'm going to do is I am going to add webbing to these areas here to line up and meet with these areas here. And a couple different ways I'm, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to look at it when I'm taking it out and working with it to see which one is going to work best and go with that uh, when I return home from the wild camp and make all my final modifications. Now on to the first real modification. From the video, you saw that I used the webbing and the uh, buckles that were already in place on this pack to see if by any chance it could be a decent load carrier. Now, this strap up here worked okay. This one down here, by nature of how it's almost attached to the very bottom lower corner of these storage areas, it just, it'll help hold this into position, but it won't help with any um, load retention. Now, when I look at the webbing that I want to use to attach my new uh, webbing straps and buckles to, I have three areas here. I have one, two, three, four areas here. It would be advantageous to be able to use this buckle that's already in place as one of those retention uh, straps. And in order to do that and to have that in a good lined up position, I noticed that the webbing on the side of the storage uh, compartment does not line up with the webbing that's on the inside panel. So that presents a couple challenges, of which I've thought out, and I'm going to try a little something utilizing both the ladder locks and the malice clips. Let me show you how I'm gonna do that. Now, as I stated before, I didn't really care for how this strap is attached to the front part of this cargo, this storage area. I thought it would be a little more advantageous to have it here as far as retention for whatever cargo I hap happen to be transporting on the main cargo area. So therefore, I can't use the webbing that's in front to line up with the ones in back, which would line up okay. So what I'm gonna to need to do is I'm going to need to facilitate the space between pairs of webbing in order to attach the webbing straps for the side retentions. And how I'm gonna do that is the first one, I'm gonna slide a malice clip down inside here. And clip that, because I'm gonna just get and put it in like this so that way this larger area is going to hold in place here. Slide that in until it clicks. And I'm going to use another one. 
in the exact same manner down here. And make certain that I go under this strap because I'm going to be using those as well. It has clicked into place. So now I have a malice clip here going through two webbings of Molly and the malice clip here going through two webbings of Molly. The next thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to attach a ladder lock to this bit of Molly webbing here. So I'm going to attach webbing for my uh, side retention of my cargo area through here at a buckle and we'll attach that webbing to this malice pack or this malice clip and the webbing will go underneath up and through. But before I do this, I'm going to need to modify my ladder lock in order to slide through the webbing. I'll show you how to do that. I'm going to show you two different methods that you can do this. One of which is involving just a hacksaw because some people don't have um, any access to other um, materials you could use like a vise or something like that to actually hold the ladder clip in place. So with a regular hacksaw, you want to hold it in a good steady position and you are going to want to cut one of the edges of the ladder lock but you're going to want to offset it just a little bit if you look at the ladder lock there's dead center what we want to do is we want to go ahead and offset that just a little bit i'm going to show you one that i've already cut so you can see what i'm talking about now, as you can see, that cut is just a little off center. And the reason we want to do that is we want to have one side a little bit longer than the other in order for that to be able to go through the webbing and to lock into place. Now, I've got my hacksaw in a good position and I'm going to eyeball the ladder lock just a little bit off center and slide it all the way in one direction. I'm going to check that to make sure that it is just a little bit off center and then very slowly without putting a whole lot of pressure on this I'm just going to slide that back and forth and now I'm going to show you another way that you can use the hacksaw to cut your ladder locks and we're going to be using a small vise. I'm going to show you how to uh, do the same technique but using a small craft vise. I'm just going to put the ladder lock inside here and I'm only going to put it over one of the bars to hold it into place. If you try to go up a little higher up through there what's going to happen is it's going to be uh, too little of a surface area to get a good grip on and it's going to slide. So I'm going to go ahead and lock that into place. And I'm going to use a small craft saw to cut in here. Now, again, I want to try to get just a little, there's center, so I'm going to get a little off center. There we go. And then back that right out there. And we now have a ladder lock that's ready for my adaption or my modification for my side webbing. Now the last way you can go about doing this is just by using a pair of wire cutters. And what you're going to do, again, go slightly off center and clip it in there. These are a little more different than the others in that there are very distinct diagonal lines that the cut was made. So therefore, you can actually push that through and it works almost like a little lock. It's not going to go in that direction easily. However, 
there is also not a lot of space between the two halves of the ladder lock. When you use a saw, you're actually removing material, whereas you're using the wire cutters, you're simply pinching them to the point to where they no longer are attached. So this is very, very tight. This could be an, uh, an advantage in that once you have it in place, it's going to lock and be much more secure. However, getting it into position is going to be more uh, difficult. Whereas you look at the ones that are cut, you can pretty easily see that there is a decent space there that's going to make it a little easier for you to squeeze the webbing through. Let's go ahead and put these in position on the pack. Now to add the ladder locks, I need to look and see where my modification is going to be. The space between these two webbings, or webbing for the Molly, is right here. So one is going to go there, and the space between those is here, so the next one's going to go there. I'm going to go ahead and put the one that I used to saw with in here. And I'm going to just sort of stick that in there. And first thing I want to do, I want to make sure that it's going to be in this position because it's, it's bowed out and the strength of the webbing straps is going to be pulling back toward me. So I don't want it to be backwards on there. I want it to be in a position where the curvature is going to go with the strength. I'm going to lift that webbing up just a tiny little bit and I'm going to force that webbing into that little opening. And again, this is the one that I used a saw to separate. And it's locked into position now. That is on there really good. If you see any of the Molly repair kits, they have ladder locks and buckles and things like that that have a very <laughs> large space and it's cut at a diagonal. With this, I found that the diagonal is not necessarily not necessarily uh, a, a benefit. Um, the space that is in those uh, parts for the Molly repair kits, it's pretty large. And I could definitely see if this these parts get uh, torqued around a good bit, how that could actually come undone. Where these are so close, the likelihood of that happening is pretty much slim to none. Now, the next bit of webbing I'm going to be putting on will be right here. So I'm going to be using the ladder lock that I modified with the wire cutters. And you can, you can hear how that clicks and that's going to allow it to lock into position. And I want to force that webbing right, right through the opening. And this is a little bit more of a challenge than the one that I used the saw to cut because there's, there's no opening there. Okay. There we go. We got it started now and that's good. I'm trying to, to hold this to where the camera can see it and it's making it a little more difficult. If I could just pick this up and relocate it, it would go on a lot easier. I'm almost there though. And hopefully it's still on frame. Let's grab the webbing and pull it through. Now again, I think this will probably lock into position and hold a little bit better. But as you can see, it's definitely a much bigger challenge to get in place than the one that was cut. Well, we are there, finally! Eureka! Now, I feel that. And it is locked into position. It has clicked. So now, I have that in position. But you know what? <laughs> I'm going to need to turn that back around the opposite way. I'm not going to make you watch that, but this is how they're going to go into position. 
And this is how I'm going to align the side straps. As I stated with the last video, I was pleased with the length of the top strap. However, it's just not in that great of an advantageous uh, position to be able to do the job I want it to do. So I'm adding two more side straps to be able to accommodate a load securely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this webbing, this strap, as a measuring device for my side straps. And I'm going to measure this exactly using my webbing. Make sure it's there. And then I'm going to fold that over and double that length. I'm going to cut that off. And with those two ends right there, I'm going to melt those just a little bit so they will not fray when I'm lacing them through the ladder lock and through the buckles. Now that I have that done, I'm going to come right back over here where it's the halfway point between the two. Cut those. Burn those off exactly the way I did before. Before we move on with the next step, I want to show you how to utilize a ladder lock. Now I'm going to be creating a loop and that loop is going to go through the opening on the ladder lock I have here and the opening I have with my malice clips. It's going to go right through there. That's where that loop is going to go. So I need to have a way to hold these two loose pieces of webbing in place and that is done using a ladder lock. Now the first thing you need to do is to recognize that there is a scored area, a rough area with lines on it on the top, and there are some that's on the bottom. You want to run your webbing up and through the bottom, and it's going to be going over top of the knurled section on top. You're going to keep a loose loop in here, and then you're going to run this through whatever area that you're going to attach it to, like the ladder lock, and then you're going to feed the loose end of the webbing up through the bottom, pull it back around, and then you are going to feed it back down through the other side. What you want to do is to have at least an inch to two inches excess on the back portion. Now, where you have your loop section, you're going to use this loose section on top to pull that up and to snug that right around the attachment point and then pull the remainder to the point to where it's in place. Now I'm going to show you how to put that onto the ladder lock here and the malice clip. Let me go ahead and get it pre-laced. Again, we want to retain a large loop there. I'm going to use this section to go through the ladder lock. I'm pulling it through and then I'm going to go through the bottom of my ladder lock that's on the webbing. Pull it up and lace that back down through the inside. And again, I want to have about an inch and a half to two inches free at the bottom. That's about an inch and a half. Then I'm going to use my top loop to pull that to where it's now snug that against the lower ladder lock. And then pull that one up right through there. I'm going to go ahead and do that with the malice clip. And then 
I'll go ahead and do that to this ladder lock and this malice clip as well using exactly the same process and I'll bring you right back. Just in case you were a little concerned on this was going to be a lot different than the ladder lock, I just want to show you real quick. I just ran the webbing after I laced my ladder lock on there up through under between the two pieces of molly webbing underneath the malice clip and I'm going to run the loose end up to the bottom section of the ladder lock. Again, make sure that loop is big and then you're going to run the end up through the inside back through the other side and you want to have about an inch and a half to two inches and that's fine. Then pull the lower section into where that's good and taut. Pull that through and that's all there is to it. I just want to walk you through real quick how to attach the buckles. You'll notice there's a knurled uh, side here. There are downward ramps on either side. On the bottom, there's knurled sections. You want to turn that to where it is the top. You want to make certain that it is lined up with the outside of the strap. You are going to run the webbing up through the non-ramped side. Run it back down through the ramp side. And that's going to allow you to adjust it and tighten it as you need to. Now I have the buckles completely installed now. And as you can see, there is pull adjustments for tightness on both sides. The buckle will be in the center and I'll be able to pull those adjustments as opposed to just one like is already on the pack. This one will have two, one on each buckle. Now in order to tame the straps, once I have them tightened down or loosened up, whatever I need to do, I don't like having all the straps flopping around. So what I'm going to do is I am going to sew a four inch section of two sided Velcro to the back side of the webbing. And I'm just going to go ahead and use a, a, a simple um, stitch back and forth right through here with my waxed linen thread with that large needle I showed you. And that should be able to wrap around any of the webbing I need and hold that into place. Now I have the Velcro sewn into place and now all you have to do is roll it around on itself and wherever you want to attach it back to the original webbing. Wrap the Velcro in behind and you have tamed webbing. I sewed all the Velcro uh, web tamers onto the webbing that I added to this pack. I just wanted to see how it was going to go, if I had enough webbing, how things were going. So I went ahead and put the hard box in from my last video and put it right in. Now, as you can see, this is a lot more area covered. It retains more of the load than the original one. It does not shift like it did on the first video before I had the opportunity to make these and to try these out. Now, I still have a fairly decent opening here, but I'm not really worried about that. If I choose to put any other type of load other, other than a, um, a hard box, ammo can, things like that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a dry bag in here and load the dry bag. So therefore, all of these open, op openings will no longer be open. With the... Um, Strap here, I think actually now, since I have my straps on them, actually lifts the front portion uh, storage area on the pack into a higher position than it did before, since I added my straps. With the addition of my two center straps here, it just provides a lot more stability now. This thing was flopping around before I put those on there. It really holds this thing together. 
And one of the nice things about this is should I choose not to use these, they can fold in and clip together on the opposite sides of one another and they'll be perfectly fine. Now, if my field tests work out well, what I plan on doing is to remove the ladder lock that I have the webbing secured with my attachment points to the pack and I'm going to sew that webbing in place and um, that way it's going to be permanent at that point. Right now the way I have this everything can be taken off of this broken back down and used for something else but I have high hopes right now that this is going to work pretty well. I left these undone so you can see how the web tamers work. I'm going to go ahead and flip this over on its front there. All I do is I roll the webbing around this Velcro. And when I get to the end, I wrap the Velcro around the webbing and it's now not flopping everywhere. Do that with this one too. Just a little bit of um, ingenuity, a little bit of creativity, a few uh, plastic parts, a few nylon parts, and I now have a pack which is one step closer to the pack that I want and the pack that I need to load medium loads out into the forest with me. Just want to give you a quick look as to what this looks like now in comparison to what it did with the first video. You can see that the load is in a much better position it's definitely much more stable. It doesn't flop around like it did um, the other day when I, I filmed the first video. I think these straps really did the trick. The next item I want to uh, modify is this section right here. These straps were designed to hold in place the IED jammer and as a result it is very small like if I wanted to put my hard box in there and use these straps to fit on that you can see <laughs> they're woefully inadequate for that I have a distance of about eight to nine inches between the two. So I'm just going to make a simple extender to connect these two buckles by adding one buckle and a piece of webbing and a couple ladder locks. Now in order to make the extenders I'm going to use some webbing and I'm going to guesstimate and I'm going to make my webbing three times the width of the back panel. And the reason being is I want the buckles to be on the side of whatever load that I put in here. And as opposed to up on the corners, so that way the, the webbing will, will fit snug on there. First thing I'm going to do is slide my ladder lock on there. Leave a loop. And I'm going to run that through one of my buckles. Run that loose webbing, webbing back up and through the ladder lock. And I want to have about an inch and a half of the webbing come through just in case I need to make any final adjustments. I have a little bit of extra there where I can do that. And that's just about perfect. I'm going to go ahead and do this to the other side, and I'll be right back. 
I have my extender complete. Let's go ahead and put the hard box on it and see how it does. As you can see, we've got a long way to go before that matches up. Put this over. And it's got a good bit of slack. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this down on both sides. So now the buckles are not on top of the box. And it has plenty of room for adjustment still. And it's good and sturdy. Now the best thing about using these ladder locks on here is if I need to shorten this, all I have to do is to pull this up. Pull it back on through. And already I've shortened it by four inches and I can do that all the way through to as small as I need to be um, there's a possibility that whatever load I'm carrying I may only need this much of an extension in theory I could go ahead and adjust this all the way down for that amount of distance between the buckles and it will still work and now I have both of my extenders in place and for this particular box, it works great because the webbing goes right up through the hinged area on both sides and it sort of locks that into position. This stabilizes the inner load, so therefore when I attach all of my other connection points, nothing inside of this is going to move, which is very important for a load hauler. Now there's going to be times to where I do not need the extenders. I may not need to have anything help out the load. If I'm hauling firewood or what have you, I can take both of these extenders off. I can put those in the top uh, pocket of the lid of the pack and go ahead and adjust these right back to where they normally go in their stowed positions. And I'm off and running. The last issue that I had with this pack dealt with how these buckles, when the, uh, the top plate is not being used, how they can be attached to the inner back panel and create less of the instability and the flopping that I have at the top part of my pack. If by any chance I add any webbing here to add buckles and I clip those, these buckles into those, there's no room for adjustability whatsoever. They're not so much that it's impossible to adjust it, it's just that being able to get inside the space between the top and the back, I don't think it's feasible to be able to get in to do any type of adjustments here. So as of right now, this little problem has me stymied. And I will come up with some type of solution in some way, shape, or form. Because it'll eat at me. <laughs> and, uh, it's just, just the way I am. It'll, I'll stew on it until I find the answer. But as of right now, that issue is going to have to stay an issue until I can figure out the right way that I want to deal with it. For anyone that may be interested, I will provide a complete list of all the parts that I used uh, to do all my modifications today in the description box. 
The one thing that I found today by setting all this up, doing all these uh, modifications, is that now I'm going to be able to carry a much larger load in this than just this strong or hard box. I have enough webbing to accommodate something a good bit larger. It could be, let's say, something as big as a, a U.S. Army sleep system, which is massive. And uh, it would definitely accommodate that. And with not utilizing the top section here, the top uh, plate, I could have a much taller load as well. So far, I'm really pleased with everything that, that's come together today. And I can't wait to get out into um, the woods tomorrow and actually give it a good proper testing. And um, as that uh, occurs, I'll definitely be uh, sharing my thoughts and um, concerns. And if there's anything that's not working well, I'll let you know. Everything that works great, I'll let you know that as well. And that's all in addition to whatever else I wind up doing while I'm wild camping. As always, folks, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.